welcome grade 11s to another installment of Life Sciences. We're into revision, and guys, I know you guys are busy writing exams, so I think this is the best lesson to have now. So we're going to be looking at revision, and it's based on topics that we've done, and these should be in paper 2, and if you're not writing a paper 2, eventually, essentially these would be topics that you would have covered collectively in one exam. But we've, div div we've divided it into a part two exam so that we can separate what we've done last week from what we're doing today. So we're going to have a look at an overview of we, what we did. We're going to try and recollect some of the work that we've done earlier on term one in terms of the classification of microorganisms. And then we went into biodiversity of plants. We looked at bi biodiversity of animals. So looking at all of those topics, we're going to have so somewhat an overview of those. We're going to deal with some specific questions some good examples of uh, questions that could help you revise and content so that you best prepared for your for your exams. So let's get straight into today's lesson. So again, so when we look at the topics in paper two guys, recollect, it's biodiversity of microorganisms and their classification. We're looking at biodiversity of plants and the biodiversity of animals. And that's basically the classification of the invertebrates and the vertebrates. So let's move on to some key concepts into what we're doing. So a recollection of the classification and biodiversity of animals. And I've just got this here so that we can refresh our memory. Remember that organisms, especially animals, are divided into two groups, vertebrates and invertebrates. We spent a lot of time earlier on this year looking at invertebrates and the classification of them. And more especially than just looking at their classification, we looked at the characteristics and how these organisms increased in complexity and how certain characteristics uh, became more advanced. So the things we looked at was, firstly we looked at was the symmetrical arrangement. So whether they were asymmetrical, symmetrical or radially symmetrical. Then we discussed things like cephalization, the development of a, a, a prominent anterior end. We then looked at, in terms of when we looked at segmentation, we looked at the types of germ layers that are developed in the embryo. So we referred to that as um, triploblastic, diploblastic. We also looked at the presence of a coelomic cavity. So we looked at the term coelom, acelom, and pseudocelom. So guys, I think you need to recollect all that. Remember, as I said, make sure that you make sure you've got a vocab list on each topic, and that should help you to recollect some of the essential concepts in most of these topics. So we did look at this. We looked at your protozoa as your flatworms. We then went on to your coelenterates. We looked at your flatworms there, annelids, echinoderms. We also spoke about mollusk, and we discussed the characteristics of them based on how they increased in complexity. And finally, we looked at the largest group in terms of the arthropods and how we how they were classified based on the external characteristics and their cephalization and body divisions. But we're going to deal with that in terms of more on a question level. So. In biodiversity of animals, we looked at how invertebrates are animals without a backbone, so that's essential to the topic. We also discussed um, some of the key features, and we classified them according to some of those key features. And those key features, as I said, were the body of symmetry, the type of gut which I mentioned earlier on, I didn't mention earlier on, but that refers to either the organism having a common uh, opening through which it ingests food and will ingest waste products, or it had a continuous tube that ran from the anterior end to the posterior end, where food entered through one opening and then was released to the other. And that we refer to as the true type of gut system. We also looked at the type of body cavity, so whether it was a true body cavity, whether it was um, and did not have a body, so we referred to those terms as either having a coelom, a coelom, or in some cases we also refer to those organisms that had a, a false body cavity or pseudocelomate. We also discussed segmentation as an adaptation of organisms as they became more complex, and that we see a characteristic become very evident in your annelids and, your, and as they showed segmentation of each of those body segments. And then obviously the most important in terms of the concentration of nerves at an anterior end to form what we call a very primitive nervous system. And that term we refer to as cephalization and how that cephalization started becoming more complex with the development of a more anterior and uh, filled with sensory cells. So that's very that's a key concept in terms of looking at how we classify animals in terms of the invertebrates. Then we looked at biodiversity of animals, and I said we use this lovely image of looking at them, and I think it's good to recollect them and to identify characteristics of them based on that. So let's get straight into some of the questions. So I'm going to read through these questions. 
I'm going to give you some time, probably about three minutes, to have a go at these, get some answers down, have a good discussion, maybe seek the help of your teachers if they're around, and even work with some of the textbooks. At the end of this, we will have a good discussion about these alternatives. So I'm going to read the question for you guys. Hope you guys are listening and paying attention. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's match each description in column A with the correct term for column B. Write the answers, letters only, from column B in the space provided below. Guys, what I think is very important as a, as a, as a takeaway from this lesson is often you find that these terms can be confusing. You have a description in column A, you've got a description in column B. How is it best to approach a question like this? I often tell my learners to first look at column B, look at all the terminology down in the term and often that helps you to so kind of recollect some of the terms so look at these terminology and often this will instantly trigger the description of that term and that often helps when you're looking at the description in column A so I'm going to read through this first I'm going to read through column B look at what these descriptions are and then go into column A so the first word is fungi and that should come to you in terms of microorganisms Saprotrophs describes how the mode of nutrition of fungi. RK refers to a group of classification that we're very familiar with. Hyphae is a structure that we see in fungi. Pneumonia would be a type of bacterial infection. Phytoplankton, guys, again, a type of protist that we, is able to photosynthesize. We also know that we've done uh, case studies or diseases in each of those groups. So AIDS would be a type of viral infection. Uh, vector would be a type of organism that is, trans that is used to transmit the disease. Eukaryotes refer to those organisms that have a true nucleus. Plasmodium was a type of, or plasmodia was a type of protist infection. And then protozoa was a group in its classification. So if you're confused about these terms, it should help by reading through these so that you kind of recollect what's important in the context of what's described to you. So I'm going to read through these and then give you an opportunity to try and put some of these answers down in, in a period of two minutes. But let's read through this. 1.1. Long strands of a fungus that can extend over a substrate. 1.2. An opportunistic infection of an HIV positive person. 1.3. Together with bacteria, fungi of this type break down dead organic matter. An organism that causes malaria is 1.4. 1.5, the kingdom of microbes where, which produce antibiotics. 1.6, cells that have a membrane bound nucleus and cell organelles. And 1.7 was is animal-like protist. So guys, the terms that you need to choose from I in the column on the extreme right hand side. So I'm going to give you two minutes to go through these descriptions and find a suitable term. And I'll see you back in two minutes.
I'm sure you guys will agree with me that some of those terms were quite confusing. But I think it's important to read those terms, look at the important keywords in that, and try and link them to a description that's given in column B. So let's go through this. Long strands of a fungus that extend over a substrate. And if we look at this, guys, the long strands that we're talking about here, remember that the fungus has got those high filled threads that stretch into the substratum. So this would be the hyphae, and these are, and that's the answer for that would be D. And we'll get to a diagram later on which actually shows this, but recollect that diagram, those high filled threads that extend across the substratum that release an enzyme that allows the, the fungus to absorb the, the organic matter from bread. Those th threads are referred to as hyphae. 1.2, an opportunistic infection of an HIV positive person. Now the key word here is opportunistic infection. It is not what is the infection called, it is the opportunistic infection. So remember that when you are HIV positive, it compromises your immune system, lowering your ability to fight off infections and hence your body is susceptible to picking up infections like the common flu, TB, pneumonia. So for this, here as we see, there's an, an example of a disease that's given and that's called pneumonia and hence you find that people that are uh, HIV positive, positive often are susceptible to diseases and that is based on how low their WBC count drops and the ability to fight off infections. 1.3 together with bacteria fungi of this type break down dead organic matter and guys if we look at the type of nutrition that fungi show they show a type of nu nutrition regarded as saprotrophic so these are organisms that feed off dead organic matter, they release enzymes, and these enzymes break down the organic matter, and through that they absorb those organic nutrients into their, into their body surfaces. 1.4, an organism that causes malaria. And guys, remember that malaria is a, plas is a, is a type of protist, and it is caused by what we call the plasmodium, and there are different strains of them. There are about four different strains, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, Plasmodium falciparae that I know three of. Okay, the fourth one doesn't come to mind immediately, but they are all belonging to the group called Plasmodia. 1.5. The kingdom of microbes which produce antibiotics. And guys, remember that antibiotics were discovered when penicillin was grown. And that would refer to the group of Fungi and fungi, the discovery of fungi, and when you go back to the experiment that was done in terms of the, the effectiveness of the secretions produced by fungi on bacterial growth, and that was a significant development in terms of how diseases have been treated. So, fungi do play an important role, especially in terms of the production of antibiotics. 1.6 cells that have a membrane bound nucleus and cell organelles. At the start of the year, you were introduced to the concept of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And essentially, these refer to organisms that have either a primitive type of genetic makeup, and that could be either a strand of DNA or RNA that is not membrane-bound, and we refer to those as prokaryotes. However, we saw that as development occurred and specialization of cell structure occurred, organisms started developing a well-defined nucleus where the chromatin network or DNA or RNA was bound within a membrane. And to those organisms, we refer to them as the eukaryotic or the true karyotic organisms, having a true nucleus. And then 1.7, finally, animal-like protists. Guys, animal-like protists, this would be your protozoa. Your protozoa, the animal-like protist, and you've got your algae, which are your plant-like protists as well. So guys, we've gone through this session, we've looked at... Uh, some multiple choice questions. I think it's important for you to be able to recollect some of those terminology questions where you ask to differentiate two terms. And so I'm going to go through these here and obviously give you something to take back and work with in a short while. So question two, differentiate between the following terms, Dip diploblastic and triploblastic, 1.2.2, a blind gut and a through gut, 1.2.3, Explain the advantages of cephalization and why is it essential in bilateral animals. So guys, I'm going to go through these very quickly and then see if we can interact with them on a, on a, on a basis of understanding these concepts in terms of differentiating between them. Now guys, if you recollect diploblastic and triploblastic, these terms are synonymous with when we refer to the number of germ layers that are present in the embryo as it starts developing. So these refer to organisms that have two body layers. Remember those body layers are the ectoderm, endoderm and mesoderm. And these refer to three germ layers in the development of the embryo. Okay, so let's go to the answers that I've done for you. So again, so diploblastic animals, 
have two layers in their embryo and these are called diploblastic animals and if we look at our triploblastic animals these are organisms that have three layers in the embryo and often these are humans or other more de developed and, and evolved organisms and they are referred to as triploblastic so they have both the mesoderm the endoderm and the ectoderm in terms of their germ layers a nice question to, that you need to pay careful attention to is the concept of the blind gut and the through gut and how that concept has become more developed as organisms become more complex now guys if we refer to a blind gut and this refers to a gut in which there is a separate mouth and anus and through okay sorry let me read this again so a gut through which there is a separate mouth and an anus that is a through gut so essentially what it means is that there's a there's a common op there's an opening through which food passes and then it is exited or it's ingested or it's released through a, an exterior opening that is an organism that has a through gut and we see this kind of specialization as the organisms become more complex and on the other hand we see organisms having a single opening through which it both takes in food as well as it releases waste and these organisms we refer to as organisms having a blind gut and kind of a very simple digestive system but having the complications of being able to ingest food and release waste products through a common opening so it doesn't make it a very efficient system and hence we see this more in the more simplified organisms in terms of your sponges that we looked at in the first group of classification 1.2.3 this was the question where we needed to explain the advantages of cephalization and why is it essential in bilateral animals guys if you recollect from cephalization cephalization we spoke about early on it refers to the concentration of nerves or sensory cells towards an anterior end if you think about organisms that are bilaterally symmetrical and the term bilaterally symmetrical refers to an organism that can be cut along a plane that produces an identical left and right side so why is it important that organisms have cephalization here remember that if we put on sensory cells into this organism here suppose it had it allows the organism to be able to respond to danger looking at both sides so the, with the advent of cephalization and the concentration of nerves along a central part towards the anterior end of the body it allows org organisms better vision and that me meant that they were able now to see danger and respond to danger more effectively and that gave them an advantage in terms of surviving and being able to either catch prey or even avoid predators so it is a concentration of organs especially the sensory organs feeding appendages and nervous tissue near the anterior end of the animal and hence we see that not only is the the eyes and the sensory cells but we also see the development of a, a defined mouth part in, term, in terms of where food can be ingested or feeding appendages that allow food to be brought into the mouth it is common among animals that are bilaterally symmetrical this allows for the concentration of nerves at the anterior end allowing bilateral symmetrical organisms to develop a nervous system to be more effective and better adapted at being able to live successfully so guys it's been a long session i know that you guys all need a stretch break so let's have a break and i'll see you back after the break welcome back guys hope you deserved that stretch break got some oxygen into those muscles let's get back into some more questions question 1.3 Indicate whether each of the statements in column 1 applies to A only, B only, both A and B, or none of them. And guys, this question can be quite confusing. You've got to read the question and respond accordingly. So your response is required. You either write A only, B only, both A, B, or none next to the question number. And often I see when marking that learners often tend to get confused as to whether they should write a b a and b and o so read the options consider them well because for each question there are four possible options so you've got to ask yourself every time you attempt this question each one of those questions have four possible options and hence spend some time reading those options out and ask yourself if it applies to a to b to both or to none and essentially if you can answer that for each individual question you should be getting that correct so spend some time read the answers out look at column two and see if both these options 
are significant, not, or either one is. So I'm going to read through these options. And remember that you can either answer with A, B, A, B, or neither. So I'm going to go through these questions in column one, the, the descriptions, and then I'm going to give you a break of probably around, let's go with three minutes. I think this requires about three minutes. It's obviously a 16 mark question. Try and work with as many as you can, and then when we get back, we'll have a discussion. So I'm going to read through the descriptions in column one, and let's see if you can come up with a correct answer, which relates to column two. So 3.1.1. The presence of a protein capsule in a well-defined nucleus. 3.1.2. A disease caused by bacteria. 3.1.3.3. The earthworm body consists of 1.3.4 plants that have naked seeds or seeds that are not covered. 1.3.5 a fluid filled body cavity found in some animals. 1.3.6 the kind of skeleton that results from muscles working against fluids in body cavities. 1.3.7 structure produced when the spore of a moss germinates and 1.3.8 the type of asexual reproduction where a single spl cell splits into two and the options that are given in column in each of those rows are either for a b a b or neither of them so guys read through column one identify whether these apply which of these column terms in column two apply and then link them and write down your answers by indicating either A, B, A and B or none. So I'll give you three minutes to do this. And at the end of three minutes, we'll look at these answers.
Well, I'm sure that was confusing. And I think it makes it confusing because there are four options for each answer. And that makes it quite difficult. And hence, you've got to really know your stuff. So these questions are by no means easy. But let's tackle them, guys. I think it's important to look at these and let's come up with some solutions. So let's again read the descriptions and let's try and see whether which of these terms match. So the presence of a protein capsule, and that's important. The presence of a protein capsule and a well-defined nucleus. And we've got descriptions here of both of a virus and a bacteria. Guys, if we look at this, remember that a protein capsule is a protective membrane that is found around an organism and a well-defined nucleus. So if you look at viruses, they don't have a well-defined nucleus. If you look at bacteria, neither do they have a well-defined nucleus. So for me, the option here would be none, neither A nor B. So none of them apply, and hence for the first one, it was none. So I hope you guys got that, but let's give it a shot with the next one. 1.3.2, a disease caused by a bacteria. Remember, bacteria cause diseases and some of the diseases that you've done would have been TB, you would have done cholera, you would have done some other diseases. But we know that purely by the process of elimination that malaria is not a disease caused by bacteria. It is a disease caused by pro protists. And hence, the answer here is only A. Cool. I think you guys are getting the hang of it. You can see how it becomes easier when you read the question and then the options. The earthworm's body consists of, let's see. Three body layers, correct? You definitely have three bodies, so they contain a mesoderm, ectoderm, and endoderm, and the body is made up of segments. So in this example, both A and B do apply, and hence we can say it's both A and B. So for that, quite simple for that option. Let's look at 1.3.4. Plants that have naked seeds. And remember that we looked at plant classification, we looked at your bryophytes, your pteridophytes, your gymnosperms and your angiosperms. And we looked at how the bryophytes and your pteridophytes produce spores. But then when we got, a, got onto the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, we looked at how they produce seeds. And what was different between the gymnosperms and the angiosperms was that in the gymnosperms, your cone-bearing plants, the seeds are exposed. They do not have a protective outer covering and hence we regard them as naked seeds. Whereas if we look at your angiosperms, your flowering plants, they produce their seeds in the ovary and these ovaries normally have a an outer ovary wall that protects the developing seed. So those seeds are said to be covered or protected. And hence, if we look at these options, so bryophytes definitely not, uh, neither are pteridophytes. So the answer here would be none because the group of organisms that actually have naked seeds are your gymnosperms. And these are your cone-bearing plants. So your gymnosperms are those organisms that have a or show naked seeds, so gymnosperms. 1.3.5, a fluid-filled body cavity found in some animals. Now guys, remember a body cavity contains coelomic fluid. So here, if we look at a fluid-filled body cavity found in some animals, a gut is not a fluid-filled body cavity. It is, it is basically a part of the digestive system that allows food to pass through. However, if we look at the term coelom, coelom is the body cavity that has um, coelomic fluid present in it. So the answer there would be B only. Let's look at 1.3.6. The kind of skeleton that results from muscles working against fluids in body cavity. Now, if I, without even looking at the options, I know that there are three types of body, uh, skeletal systems. You've got an exoskeleton, an endoskeleton, and then the hydrostatic skeleton. And of that, the hydrostatic skeleton is the one that uses body fluids to give the body shape. So here we've got endoskeleton, that option is wrong, but we have the option of B, which is a hydrostatic skin, so it's only B, so it's B only that can be considered for that option. 1.3.7, the structure produced when a spore of a moss germinates. Now remember that mosses germinate and they produce a heart-shaped structure which we know as the thallus. If we look at here, you've got prothallus, which is incorrect, and sporangium, no, we see that in fungi. So the answer here would be none because we know that the structure that these develop would be very different to what the thallus is. And finally, 1.3.8, a type of sexual asexual reproduction, guys, that's the key word in this, where the single cell splits into two. So a type of asexual reproduction in which a single cell splits to form two cells. Now, if you go and look at the options, yes, binary fission is 
a possibility. But meiosis, meiosis is a type of reproductive division, where which a type of division which occurs for the production of reproductive cells. And by that I mean, I mean I refer to sperms and eggs. We refer to pollen. We refer to the ovules. And hence, this would not be a type of asexual reproduction. So when meiosis takes place, it is actually for sexual reproduction. And hence, the op the option B would be incorrect. And here the answer would be A only. I think. It can get very confusing, especially with the terms. And I think it basically a question like this will test your ability of understanding the content and how you can you can you can bring that content into a concept of understanding a specific uh, description. So again, practice with these. I think these are good questions to actually test your understanding of a specific topic. Uh, do them as a practice so that it increases your understanding of the content. We're going to go on to the next question, but I think. I'm going to go through as much as I can and then give you a little break to stretch those legs and to get some oxygen in. Study the graph below and answer the questions that follow. So here we have a graph and as I always say, when you have a graph guys, look at the heading, look at the x-axis, look at the y-axis and try and understand what this graph is showing. So on the x-axis we see time. And that's given from a period of 1997 all the way to 2004. So it's obviously showing you trends. And on the y-axis, we see the number of cases. And so that is illustrated in units of 5,000. And then the heading for the graph is basically reported cases of TB. And from the general trend that you can see in this graph is that since 1997, the number of cases of reported for TB has steadily increased. So essentially what this means is that it's possibly more awareness about TB or that there are more people being affected with TB. Let's interpret this in the context of the question. So I'm going to get back to this graph, but let's look at some of these questions. 1.4.1. In which year was the highest number of TB cases reported? Again, this is a question that you're going to go back to the graph and try and extrapolate based on looking at which is the tallest bar. 1.4.2. Calculate the total number of TB cases in 2003 and 2004. So here you've got to look at probably adding up the two years so that you can get to an answer. And then 1.4.3, what trend is shown by the data on the graph? And that's a two mark question. So you've got to describe whether there's an increase or whether there's a constant uh, rate or whether there's a decrease. So you've got to look at the trend. So the trend will basically be defined describing how the, how the changes in the graph occur over a period of time. And then 1.4.4 is so just one reason why this trend is taking place. So quite interesting questions. It leads a lot into interpretation of the information on the graph and how you understand and take that information and assimilate an answer. So I think it's an important skill that you all need to practice and to look at. So let's look at my answers. I'm going to go back to the question on the graph so that you can bring that home in terms of understanding how I've got those answers. So 1.4.1, in which year was the highest number of TB cases reported? And this was easy because all you need to do is refer straight to the graph and identify in which year was the highest number of TB cases reported. So I put on a trend line earlier on showing you how this occurred. So if we look at the highest graph here, if we look at 2003, 2004, we can see that 2003 has got a significant edge of it. So it definitely would be in the year 2003. So if we go on to the next question, we had to calculate the total number of TB cases in 2003 and 2004. And guys, this was quite simple because what you had to do was, again, a maths question. So make sure you have a calculator because often your teachers can ask you to take information from this and analyze that. So in this, what it meant was a total would be, you've got to take these two numbers and add them up to get the total that I've got in my answer. So adding those two up, 44,414 plus another 44,145 should give you an answer as I've indicated here. It's about 88,559. That is correct. You can check that with your answers. Use a calculator, guys. I think it's important that you should be able to have a calculator in an exam. You sometimes often ask to find averages or add up totals or even work out the percentage. So make sure you have a calculator Regardless of the type of exam, I mean, if it's life sciences, maths, history, please carry a calculator. 1.4.3, what trend is shown by the data on the graph? And if we look at the graph, guys, you can see that 
there's an increase in the trend and as I indicated earlier on, I tried to show that there was a trend here. So you're seeing that the number of cases increased from 1997 to 2003 and decreased slightly in 2004. So as I go back to that graph, you can see that there was a steady gradual increase and then it went up and then there was a gradual decrease in there and that could be that could we cannot read too much into that it's only plotted to 2004 if we see that however we're not too sure in terms of whether that trend continues but it could make a nice question in terms of um, uh, where the government has now introduced awareness campaigns discuss probably the trend of how that graph would look in the next 10 years if a successful awareness campaign around TB has been established. So then you can obviously motivate as to why the trend should decrease and link that to the awareness around the treatment of TB and the early diagnosis of it. So just the last question and then I think a well-deserved break for you all. So just one reason why this trend is taking place. So again leads to that question. So it's probably due to an increase in the population and if we do think of this there's a definite increase in population and disease being a, a, a disease that spreads with um, the population increasing or in areas where they are high density you'll find that as the population tends to increase there's a greater possibility of the infection rate increasing and hence you'll find more people living in poorer conditions and these conditions are generally uh, ideal for infections like bacteria like bacterial infections to spread and hence Diseases like TB that pick up a lower immune system often are able to spread more, more, more effectively in terms of infecting individuals. So guys, that was a question that was dealing with, H with bacterial infections and TB and hearts being treated. You guys deserve a break. I'm going to give you a short break to stretch and then I'll see you at the end of the break. Guys, the last segment, hang in there. But I think what I want to do in this segment is I want to do some questions that are obviously more extended, higher order thinking questions that allows more application of knowledge. I've put in a question here which requires a bit of your experimental design and I think that will always be in an assessment. So I think it's the best way to revise for, for these types of questions. Let's read it. Learners want to investigate the effect of different antibiotics. So we're looking at different antibiotics on the growth rate of certain bacterial species. They set up nutrient agar plates and place sterile discs containing three different antibiotics on each of the plates. Study the diagram and answer the questions that follow. So guys, in terms of when we look at bacterial studies, we often need to culture them. And these bacteria are cultured in, 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 in sterile agar plates. And agar plates are basically a medium, a broth medium, which contains essential nutrients that has been sterilized. By that I mean, so all the bacteria and germs that are possibly in the microorganisms have been killed. And this is pure based nutrient medium. And that might have a bit of beef extract. It might have some of the essential nutrients required by microorganisms to grow. And these are then uh, cultured, cultured with a specific strain of bacteria. And that's generally done to identify or to look at the way organisms grow in terms of identifying the culture of organisms growing. So that can be used from an educational purpose as well, as we see in this question. So an agar plate, guys, the word sounds, it's a plate which contains a kind of a medium onto which bacteria can be cultured or grown. And here we're seeing antibiotic 1, which is administered in this area here. We're seeing antibiotic 2, which is administered on that area there. And we're seeing antibiotic 3 administered in that area here. And around it, you find these spots. And these little dots indicate the growth of bacteria. So these are bacterial colonies that are growing. And often these bacterial colonies grow in the absence of something that causes their death. So in, we can see this. In, in the first agar plate, you can see the antibiotic causing some kind of area here. And that area there where there is no growth of bacteria is called the zone of inhibition. I'm not too sure if you guys have heard about that. But basically, it's an area where there's no growth. So it's called the zone of inhibition and that means in these areas they are the antibiotic that is administered will cause any bacteria growing close by to to either die or destroy them if we look at antibiotic two guys no apparent re re region that shows the destruction of of bacteria here and hence i could very assume easily assume that this antibiotic here is not as effective as antibiotic one because I don't see any clear defined zone of inhibition 
around the spot in terms of where the antibiotic was administered. If we do look at the third agar plate, here we're seeing a very large area of inhibition, indicating that this antibiotic has been very effective in destroying some of the bacteria as close uh, as far as that. And hence, it is showing how effective. And if we look at the density of the colonies in this, it is significantly lower. So we kind of say that this is quite a good antibiotic. I'll give it three ticks. This is not that good. In fact, not very effective at all. And antibiotic one seems to have some effect, but not very effective. And hence, guys, it's very important to understand that there are different types of antibiotics that are used to treat different types of infections. And hence, when you do visit a doctor, he, he knows exactly what type of antibiotic to give you. And that's based on the type of infection that you have and the area in terms of where that infection is. And hence, what I'm point is that you cannot self-medicate and decide on taking antibiotics because without any prior knowledge. It has to be administered through a, through a doctor who understands that. And we go into the, the, the discussions around how antibiotics have been used and how effective they are if they're not used correctly. And that, that discussion is very important in terms of understanding how antibiotic resistance develops in bacteria. So let's get to these questions and we'll try and answer them. What is an antibiotic? That's very important. It's very important to know what an antibiotic is. 3.2. What is the function of agar plates? And I discussed this briefly at the start. 3.3. Mention one precaution that the learners would have to take to ensure that their results are valid. And it's very important when culturing bacteria or culturing microorganisms, there are several precautions that you need to take. And those precautions are important in terms of firstly protecting yourself and then secondly ensuring that the protocol in terms of ensuring your results are accurate are followed. 3.4. Which factor would the learners have kept constant during the investigation? I think that's important to understand the control variables as well. And then 3.5, use the information in the diagram to describe the results of the investigation. And that's a three mark question. So I'm going to get straight to the answers and we'll try and interact with these as I describe what the answers are. So what is an antibiotic? And often know that you get learners that talk about, so I'm not well, I'm on antibiotics. But do we understand what antibiotics are? And if you go back to uh, the experiment that we've done in terms of identifying the effect of uh, something like penicillin antibiotic growth. So antibiotics are basically chemical substances. And these are chemical substances that reduce the growth of bacteria by killing them or preventing them from reproducing. And these can either work by releasing certain chemicals or they could target certain processes in there. So they either destroy the outer membrane or they target certain enzymes that the bacteria that infects your cells are containing. So you get different types of antibiotics and different strengths of them. But essentially, they are chemicals, and often these are produced from um, penicillin or from fungi. 3.2. What is the function of agar plates? And agar plates, guys, are basically, as I said, are mediums or culture mediums which contain nutrients, and they are provided so that the bacteria can be cultured or grown on them. So basically, they are bacteria me culture mediums on which bacteria can be cultured or grown and that's to study the growth or colony or identify the type of microorganism that is growing. 3.3 Mention one precaution that the learners would have to take to ensure that the results are valid. The one precaution that learners should take is that one is that they should they've got to make sure that the agar plates are in sterile conditions and by that I mean when you open when you are doing an investigation if you're going to open those agar plates and obviously atmospheric air is around that air contains germs by touching it with your hands. So one of those precautions that they need to take is they've got to make sure that they are working in a sterile environment, that their hands are sterile, that it's an aseptic condition so that the, the area around is not influencing the contamination of the agar plates. It's also to make sure that the agar plates are not contaminated by other bacteria and fungi from the air. 3.4. Which factors would the learners have kept constant during the investigation. I think it's important for us to control variables, even to be able to identify what the independent and dependent variable is. I'll probably extend you with that question in a little while. So what are the factors that have to be kept constant? We've got to keep all the plates at the same temperature. We know that temperature can influence the results. We know that bacteria tend to grow favorably in certain ideal conditions of temperature, moisture. So we've got to make sure that the temperature is constant because that could affect the growth rate of these bacteria. We also need to ensure that the plates have the same amount of nutrients. 
and in the same concentration. So when we when we load the plates, when we create the agar medium, you know that bacteria, if you provide it with more nutrition, they'll go grow better. And hence we've got to ensure that the concentration of the agar and the amount of nutrients placed into that agar medium is the same. So the concentration of the agar medium, the amount of nutrients, the same temperature, and you've got to allow them the same amount of time to culture because you often get bacteria growing at different rates. And if they're different strains of bacteria, you find that the rates of growth, rates of growth are different. And hence you need to contain the time through which that investigation is carried out. 3.5. Use the information in the diagram to describe the results of the investigation. So how would you describe the results? And as I said, I tried to analyze the results. I'm not too sure. I think we've got about two minutes left, but I'm going to try and do that. Um, so antibiotics 3 was the most effective in destroying the bacteria. So when we looked at those circles, we saw that around antibiotic 3, when the antibiotic was applied, the growth of the bacteria was very slow around these areas here. When we look at antibiotic 2, it was ineffective. So by that we meant that here we could see that there was no inhibition zone and hence we can call that an ineffective antibiotic. When we look at antibiotic 1, it was effective but if you recollect guys, it showed you a small area of inhibition. So it was applied there but we saw that there was growth around there with a small area around here that showed no growth. So this area was the area of inhibition, significantly effective but not as effective as antibiotic 3. And as I said, I would rate antibiotic 3 the most effective in terms of treating that type of bacterial infection. So cool guys, I think we've got to the end of the session, but I want to leave you with uh, a little mini essay question. And I think it's important for you to be able to prepare on such a question. And and I think it's, just a, it's a long shot, but I think you need to prepare for questions based on structural and functional adaptive of organisms or even structures and a nice question would be explain the relationship between cell size and surface area volume to ratio in invertebrates by referring to the images below so essentially what this question lends to is it talks about how organisms are adapted by having cellular structures put together to make them effective and if we compare them to a large object and how that surface to volume ratio is is less effective and hence this question essentially deals with how surface area to volume ratio is an is an ideal adaptation for some of the multicellular organisms in terms of going through met, uh, homeostasis and maintaining body processes if we compare them to single cell organisms that are large so guys it, it takes us to the end of the session look at questions that you can possibly prepare well on work smart all the best for your exams hang in there